we shall start now good evening and welcome you all i be on behalf of department of english and uh, comparative literary studies saurash university welcome all the participants i see most of the faces who are known and who have been regularly participating in all the lectures so hello and welcome to all the participants uh, today's uh, speaker mr rohal rawal is uh, a young scholar who is pursuing his phd at uh, at the bhakt kavi narsi mehta university junagadh on the topic of adaptation especially with reference to film studies and uh, he has uh, cleared both net as well as gset so somebody who has uh, a kind of neck for the competitive exam at state level as well as the national level so the speaker is also a graduate from baudin college junagadh and he has done his masters from Uh, department of english rajkot uh, today he is going to speak on post structural studies and deconstruction uh, with special reference to this deconstruction if i i understand it correctly uh, i welcome you oh, mr rohal uh, the stage is yours now thank you thank you thank you very much ma'am respected faculty members of department of english and cls saurashtra university rajkot Uh, faculty members from universities and colleges across and beyond gujarat uh, fellow phd scholars and dear students very good evening to you all the topic for today as ma'am mentioned is post structuralism and deconstruction a conceptual overview uh, let me just turn on the screen sharing is the ppt visible hello yes rahul okay thank you thank you yes uh, post structuralism and deconstruction now post structuralism is usually said to begin with originate from or often equated with uh, jacques derrida's paper titled structure sign and play in the discourse of the human sciences which he presented at uh, johns hopkins university in the year 1966 so what we find is that often post structuralism and deconstruction are discussed parallelly if not synonymous what we will try to do is first try to uh, define this broad term post structuralism under which we can club uh, derrida's theory of deconstruction what do we mean by post structuralism obviously the word post means after after structuralism so what is it after structuralism derrida's paper structure sign and play or post structuralism as a whole intends to or aims to uh, offer a critique of the saussurean structuralist conception especially the saussurean conception of the sign which according to saussure is divisible into the signifier and the signified now we all know that uh, when we divide the sign into these two parts the signifier and the signified the signifier is anything that is written that is spoken that we see or listen to and the signified is obviously the concept or the idea that immediately the written uh, or the verbal Uh, words or letters uh, generate in our mind and this leads saussure or the entire structuralist enterprise to the uh, to form the assumption that as soon as we listen to something as soon as we read something as soon as we encounter any sign it is very much possible to es- extract to dig out from the sign from the text a singular a definite a concrete meaning and derrida or post structuralism or deconstruction says hold your horses you know uh, it is not actually the case there actually does not exist any transcendental signified is what uh, derrida or post structuralism would say 
there is no singular extractable meaning from a text or from a set of texts what new criticism uh, believes in that as soon as you read or make a close reading of the text you will be able to determine or pull out or extract or dig out one concrete singular precise meaning deconstruction or post structuralism on the other hand celebrates the plurality or free free play of meanings is that there is always the possibility of more than one meaning existing side by side existing simultaneously existing at the same time and it is very difficult to decide which meaning uh, to prefer which meaning is correct because both the meanings or even more than two meanings can be correct at the same time and we cannot say this is only correct and this is wrong or this is wrong and only this the first one is correct so it is uh, the critique of the linguistic enterprise post structuralism or deconstruction is critiquing the saussurean concept of the sign or critiquing the naive assumption that we have that language is transparent at the moment we read something we encounter any sign we have, we will be able to determine a single precise concrete meaning and there it our post structuralism says no it is not so simple a case obviously this should also Uh, remind us of uh, William Emerson's ambiguities, seven types of ambiguity, which he discussed in uh, his book uh, in the year 1930. Uh, at the same time, post-structuralism, apart from critiquing language or the Saussurean model of the sign, is also a critique of centers. Uh, those centers which occupy or are uh, power centers, which are paradoxically, simultaneously, at the same time. within and outside the structure those centers which determine everything that happens within the structure but at the same time they themselves are not bound by any rules by any regulations by any conventions this is uh, also a, a critique that structure post structuralism engages in the third point is that structuralism or uh, post structuralism offers a critique of binaries because language especially western languages uh, post structuralism says always divides everything into pairs of two into two entities or binaries where the entity which occupies the first position is often in a position of power is often in a position of privilege and the entity or the object or the person that occupies the second position is often exploited oppressed it lacks agency it lacks the power or the ability to decide on its own so what derrida or deconstruction or post structuralism aims to do is to reverse the binaries if possible or dismantle the binaries if possible to bring the second entity which has been oppressed or exploited or has been lacking agency to bring it at the front to give it uh, its rights back to it uh, at the same time it is also a celebration of interpretations rather than believing that any text has a predetermined meaning which a reader only has to dig out or extract post structuralism or deconstruction says there is nothing other than interpretations the only thing that exists are interpretations i might interpret the same text differently and another reader will interpret the same text in a vastly or completely or radically different manner as rola bar writes in his essay the death of the author the birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author obviously again this should uh, remind us of uh, the post structural or deconstructive link with new criticism where uh, wimsett and beardsley had already argued that uh, it is the reader who should be the center of focus rather than relying on or talking about what was the intention of the author the intentional fallacy so post structuralism or deconstruction somewhere does contain an echo of uh, this new critical thought of the intentional fallacy and last and again very important crucial is that post structuralism is a celebration of intertextuality it is a critique or dismantling of the notion of originality the romantics used to believe in this concept of original genius that whatever a writer creates is original 
completely original nothing like it had ever come before but uh, post structuralism says that every text is either influenced by previous texts or simply reworks or rewrites previous texts so these are uh, some of the major points that uh, post structuralism is concerned with uh, let us quickly repeat them the first is the critique of the sign the critique of the assumption that as soon as we uh, listen to language or we read anything we would be able to dig out a single precise clear definite meaning it is not the case post structuralism or deconstruction says there will always be more than one meaning existing at the same time simultaneously it is also a critique of centers centers which are power centers those who occupy positions of power and the problem is that while they occupy positions of power they determine everything what happens within the structure they themselves are not bound by any rules or restrictions it is also a critique of binary oppositions when two entities uh, exist simultaneously side by side but the first one is more powerful privileged over the second or the other one and it is also a celebration of interpretations it is a celebration of free play is that ultimately everything depends on the reader or the listener or the viewer to determine what is the meaning there is no correct or single meaning and it is also a celebration of intertextuality how each text reworks or rewrites previous texts instead of being completely unique or original so uh, we often say derrida is the uh, post structuralist he indulges in the criticism of the social model of the sign but is it so can we consider derrida the very first post structuralist because apart from derrida who is concerned with the structure of language there are other structuralists who are concerned if not with language then with other pertinent or relevant matters or aspects karl marx also can be considered a post structuralist because he indulges in an analysis of the structure of society and the society that he finds with two classes the bourgeoisie on the one the haves on the one side and the proletariat of the have nots on the other and he tries to incite or influence a change or revolution in society whereby a capital less a class less private property less society is established he is also analyzing a structure structure of society and is trying to bring about a change in that structure he is a post structuralist nietzsche uh, he very boldly declares that god is dead the enlightenment of the 16th and 17th century the belief in science and reason and logic make it impossible to continue to believe in an entity called god and even if such an entity exists it is not commensurable with the idea or the arguments that science or logic or reason makes he is also a post structuralist trying to change the theological structure or challenge the predominant theological structure of the belief in god even freud is a post structuralist but here in the case of the human mind because before freud the idea was that uh, the human mind is a, uh, an a single entity which works uh, based on its desires or something uh, but freud says that no there are actually three different forces influencing the mind the human mind it is not a unified whole there are three uh, different and contradictory forces at work on one side he says there is the id or the pleasure principle and on the other side there is the ego or the morality principle there is often a clash between the two the id tries to fulfill its desires immediately the ego tries to control it uh, tries to point out uh, some bridge whereby immediate gratification is delayed but uh, moral or ethical gratification is achieved so each and every of this thinker or philosopher or theorist is indulged in understanding one or the other kind of structure and afterwards bringing about a change in that structure whether it is social theological religious or psychological derrida is one among this long chain where he is concerned with the structure of 
language and when he analyzes the structure of language he finds that it is very shaky he finds that it is very unreliable so we have three very simple sentences written in front of us and the moment we pay a, even a slightly close attention to them we understand how unreliable uh, language or linguistic communication can be john wrote a poem on the mountains so immediately we have two meanings before us did john write a poem on the mountains that is were mountains the subject of john john's poem or whether john went to the peak of the mountain to the top of the mountain he sat there amidst the wind and the snow and everything and he wrote the poem there in the two meanings the bark was painful so is it the bark of a dog who is maybe hurt who is maybe in pain and that is why is making noise of complaint or is it the bark of a tree on which a person is sitting and that bark is rough it is hard it is painful to sit on again we have two meanings or the last and the third one sorry should... sir uh, sorry for interrupt uh, have you changed the slide because uh, only first slide is in front of us yes i am uh, continuously changing the slides no sir it not works okay okay give me a minute let me stop screen sharing and restart it thank you sir okay now uh, do the slides uh, change are you able to follow yes sir derrida's theory of deconstruction the title is uh, now did the slide change no no no, no rahul uh, then uh, can i request if it is possible to run the uh, ppt from the uh, from your side ma'am if possible uh you can send me uh, you mail me this ppt and then i'll run it from this side i have mailed it to you uh, today evening itself हेलो प्रतीक्षा मैम यस आई एम डाउनलोडिंग इट वेट वेट फॉर अ मिनट ओके ओके is it visible to you yes ma'am yes it is visible yeah see is it changing hello ha yes uh, yes yes it is changing yes yeah so uh, 
we can quickly uh, now uh, hi yes ma'am it is working fine yes it's working pratiksha didi okay yeah so we yeah, can quickly, thank you okay thank you thank you uh, we can quickly uh, re summarize the points uh, if possible uh, if we could go to the second slide the second slide So, oh, ma'am, uh, the second slide. Yes, thank you. So, yes, uh, we were trying to understand uh, or define what do we mean by the term post-structuralism. As I said, it is often said to have originated from Derrida's paper, which he presented at Johns Hopkins University. Title: Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences in the year 1966. And uh, post-structuralism and deconstruction are often discussed parallelly, uh, if not synonymously. They are often conjoined. Now, what is post-structuralism, or what is deconstruction, from which uh, this uh, theory or idea of post-structuralism emerges? It is a critique of the Saussurean concept of the sign. Saussure, as we all know, uh, said that a sign is divisible into two components: the signifier and the signified. The signifier is any written words, letters, or verbal words or letters that we listen to, and the signified is the mental idea or concept that we form by listening to these words or letters. And Saussure or structuralism believes that the moment we come across any sign. Uh, we are immediately able to or we would be immediately be able to determine what it what is the concept what is the signified what is it trying to say and post structuralism or deconstruction says that hold your horses it is not always possible to be immediately clear what does a sign say or what is the signified of the sign post structuralism or deconstruction says that there is a uh, very less possibility that a transcendental signified exists that a clear single precise or singular meaning exists rather uh, derrida or post structuralism says that there will always be a plurality of signifieds a plurality of meanings uh, there will always be more than one meaning available so post structuralism or deconstruction is a critique of the saussurean notion of the sign or the saussurean concept of language which believes that it gives us single singular i think uh, the ppt sharing has stopped uh, let me again uh, retry it from my side is it visible Yes, sir. Slides change. Yes. Okay. So we are uh, on slide. Uh, yeah. What is post-structuralism? So uh, one is this critique of the uh, notion that language immediately gives out single or clear or precise meanings. So post-structuralism or deconstruction says that it is not possible. There will always be more than. one meaning immediately when we read any ling language or linguistic entity the second point is that post structuralism or deconstruction is a critique of centers power centers in other words those who determine what will happen within the structure those who decide what will happen within the structure but are themselves beyond any criticism beyond any regulation beyond any control the third point is it is a critique of binary oppositions is that there will always be two entities whether it is in language or whether it is in society there will always be two entities and the first entity or one of the entity will occupy a position of power or privilege and the other entity will be weaker will be lacking agency the ability to make decisions or take actions 
will be oppressed or exploited. And what post-structuralism or Derridean deconstruction aims to do is reverse this binary, or if possible, dismantle this binary, whereby the second entity, which has been oppressed or exploited for long, uh, comes to uh, regain its rights, comes to occupy a proper or uh, proper position. At the same time, post-structuralism or deconstruction is a celebration of interpretations, because as we discussed, uh, it rejects the possibility of a single meaning or the possibility of digging out or extracting a singular meaning from a text. Rather, what it says, what post-structuralism says is that there are only interpretations. Only interpretations exist. My interpretation of the same text, of the same linguistic entity, will be completely different from the interpretation made by any other reader. So what Rola Ba says, the birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. Everything ultimately depends on how the reader interprets the text or the language before him or her. And finally, post-structuralism or deconstruction is also a celebration of intertextuality. The belief that each and every text reverts or rewrites previous texts. It is a critique or dismantling of the notion of romantic originality. The romantics were very fond of this concept of original genius. Everything that a writer writes or creates or an artist creates is unique, is original. And post-structuralism says that originality is not possible. It questions this possibility. It says that every text is just a rewriting or a reworking of the texts that have come before it, the anterior or the precursor texts. Now, uh, we also uh, try to situate Derrida within a tradition of post-structuralism, wherein we discuss that Marx or Nietzsche or Freud will also be or have to be considered as post-structuralist because all of them are concerned with one or the other kind of structure and trying to bring about a change in that structure. Marx uh, analyzes the societal structure and tries to bring about a change in it to bring out a classless, propertyless society, so he's a social post-structuralist. Nietzsche questions or pronounces that uh, God is dead. He raises question on the possibility of the existence of God, uh, especially after enlightenment, uh, the 16th and 17th century enlightenment, uh, the development of scientific ideas, logic and reason, which makes it very difficult to believe in an entity called God. So he is a theological post-structuralist who tries to change this uh, assumption or the structure of religion. And finally, we have Freud, who tries to map the structure of the human mind, where he conceptualizes that three different forces uh, exist or work simultaneously in tandem, uh, pulling uh, a person in different directions, the e the ego, and the superego. So all of these uh, thinkers or philosophers uh, are post-structuralist in the sense that they analyze a particular kind of structure and then try to bring about a change in how the structure is conceived or is at that particular moment. So Derrida falls into this long chain or tradition where he is concerned with the structure of language. And when Derrida analyzes the linguistic grounds or the linguistic structure, he finds that it is very shaky, it is very unreliable, you cannot trust it. So we have three sentences before us. The moment we pay a little closer attention to them, we realize that we cannot trust or be sure of language conveying to us a precise or clear meaning. Because when we read the sentence, John wrote a poem on the mountains, we have two meanings before us. Did John write a poem on the mountains? Was the subject of his poem mountains? Or did John go to the mountain top, to the hilltop, and he sat there and wrote the poem? The two meanings. Again, the bark was painful. It is either the bark of a dog who is hurt, who is in pain, or is it the bark of a tree on which a person is sitting and the bark is rough and hard, so painful to sit on? And finally, the fisherman went to the bank. So is it the bank, the river bank, where the fishermen would normally go to fish? Or is it the financial bank, 
where we go to make transactions, take and exchange money. So each of these three sentences, the moment we think a little bit about them, we see that they are not straightforward in giving out a meaning. They always give out meaning in excess. Uh, extra is always there. So the very first thing that Derrida tries to point out is that language is unreliable. He is critiquing uh, what we call or he calls metaphysics of presence, a term which he borrows from Martin Heidegger, the philosopher. Metaphysics of presence in simple words is this naive belief or assumption that the moment I read something, I will be very clear what it means. The meaning is always present. I just have to read it and I will understand it. There will always be a single clear, precise meaning. Or Derrida is also critiquing logocentrism. Logocentrism, obviously, the word comes from logos, which means the word of God. And the word of God is very clear. It is very precise. It is unambiguous. So God, for example, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. So these uh, statements or uh, affirmatives are very clear. There is no ambiguity within them. But Derrida says that the language that we use or the everyday language that we use or the literary language that we encounter is not so straightforward. It is not so it is not so reliable. And so Derrida is very much doubtful of the possibility of a transcendental signified, the possibility that a single, clear, precise meaning exists. Rather, he says that language often leads to aporia. That is, the moment when you hesitate, the moment where you are not able to decide which meaning is correct. The bark was painful. Is it the bark of a dog or is it the bark of a tree? The fisherman went to the bank. Is it the river bank or is it the financial bank? You cannot decide. You cannot determine. It is a moment of hesitation or undecidability or aporia. And no one can say that only one meaning is correct and the other is wrong because both meanings are correct at the same time. To put it in other words, language betrays itself. Language is so shaky on its foundation that it always gives out meaning or signified in excess. So we have a very simple example, literary example in front of us from Robert Frost's The Road, uh, the Road Not Taken. And this is the last stanza of the poem where the speaker is saying that I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. Now, often this last stanza of this poem as a whole has been taken as a celebration of being bold, of how to achieve success. And the speaker says that he achieved success by taking the road less traveled by, is that people warned me and asked me, don't do this. This area is not for you. This profession is not for you. But I did not listen to them. I went ahead. I wanted to become an actor, for example. People told me, don't. It is a very unreliable or uncertain profession. But I did not listen to anyone. I went ahead and today I am successful. I am successful because I took the road less traveled by. I did not listen to what others told me, what others asked me to do and I am successful. This is obvious, often the meaning that we make of the poem. But the word sigh, the very single word, it can be a sigh of contentment also, that I am successful because I did not listen to others and I worked on what I had decided to work on. It can be a sigh of contentment. But it can also be a sigh of discontent. Another meaning is also possible at the same time. Why did I fail? Why did I encounter failure? I failed because I did not listen to what others told me. I wanted to become an actor and the others told me that don't be, don't go to this profession. There is no guarantee of success. But I did not listen. I went ahead. I kept on trying for five years, ten years. I did some small roles, its and bits here and there. But I did not become a very famous actor what I wanted to become. So I achieved failure or I encountered failure because I took the road less traveled by. I chose the profession or the road which not many people have chosen. So is the poem 
or is robert frost or is the signifier if we take this entire poem or this entire stanza as a signifier is this signifier talking about success or is this signifier talking about failure it depends on how the reader will interpret it for a speaker uh, for a reader who has been successful in his life after struggling and choosing a profession what others asked him or her not to choose the speaker would say that i achieved success because of my choice and for a person a speaker who achieved failure by choosing a less safe profession despite others is warnings not to might say that this is a poem about failure this is talking about failure so ultimately it depends on how the reader interprets or responds to the text to the text similarly we have wh uh, oden's poem called a shining life or who's who it is a sonnet and which talks about two persons and if you read it closely you will be very hard pressed to determine who these two persons are is are the two persons uh, a father and a son are the two persons of uh, uh, two brothers is it a uh, son and a mother the same uh, poem or the same text or the same signifier but you can come up with a number of possible relations between the two persons that are being mentioned someone will say uh, this is uh, the son and the father someone will say these are two brothers someone will say this is the son and the mother uh, so who are the people or the uh, characters in this poem each reader might answer differently and each reader at the same time might be or will be correct so derrida coins a term a portmanteau term the combining two words and making a new word he coins the word defiance defiance which uh, combines one french word and one english word the french word is differ differer to be different that uh, the signs have meaning the saussurian idea that signs have meaning because every sign is different from the other sign why does the sign cat have a meaning because the sign cat is different from the sign dog because the sign cat is different from the sign aeroplane because the sign cat is different from the sign car so one meaning is possible only because of differences but Derrida adds the second sense, that of deferring, that of delaying, that of pushing back, is that often when you read something or you encounter language, rather than coming across a single or precise meaning, meaning is always delayed. Meaning is always pushed back. You cannot say with surety. You cannot say with concrete uh, surety that this is the only correct meaning. or this is the only thing that the text is trying to say so as we mentioned or discussed with regards to frost's poem is the poem talking about success or is the poem talking about failure both can be uh, said to be correct or both are correct so defiance meaning is always pushed back meaning is always delayed it is absent yet present it is present yet absent secondly derrida's theory is also a critique of centers power centers derrida says the center is not the center and it is a very paradoxical or contradictory statement to make what is he trying to say what he is saying is that anything that occupies the center at the structure determines everything that happens within the structure for example uh, in the medieval times or in the middle ages god was at the center anything and everything that happened in the world happened because of the will of god uh, there is a uh, abundance of harvest it is the will of god there is an earthquake it is the will of god there is a flood it is because god wanted it to be so the thing is that the center determines everything what will happen in the structure what will happen in the world god determines everything but you cannot go and question the center you cannot go to god and you cannot ask why there was this flood 
or why there was this earthquake or why did you give us such a good harvest this year and not the previous year or why did you give us a good harvest the previous year and not this year questioning the center questioning the entity which controls everything within the structure is not permissible is not possible and that is why derrida says that the center is at the same time both within and outside the center it determines everything uh, what happens in the structure and at the same time it is outside the structure no rules or regulations apply to it after god monarchs or kings or rulers uh, came to occupy the center the same thing happens again monarchs can make any decision can take any action which might be beneficial uh, to the populace which might be harmful or hurtful to the populace again you cannot go to the monarch or the king or the queen and question them why did you do this we will not accept this critiquing or questioning the center is not permissible obviously the monarchs of those times earlier times can be replaced with the politicians of today a politician or one who occupies the power center can take any decision but if we cannot question him or her and if we try to question him or her there will be repercussions technology for example technology can be both good as well as bad or harmful technology can be helpful because even in the time of the pandemic we are able to conduct online classes engage in online engagement but technology can also be harmful and scams take place money are being stolen from your digital account you cannot go to the entity called the technology and question it why did you do this that is good or why did you do this that is bad questioning the center the one who occupies the powers in the structure is not permissible or is not possible third binary oppositions language or society at large derrida says is often controlled or uh, found with binary oppositions where there are always two entities uh, in opposition to each other for example we have the binary oppositions between the white and the black or what we call racism and obviously the first entity is occupying a privileged position a position of power and the second entity that are the blacks are at a weaker position they lack agency they lack the ability to make choices or decisions they are oppressed and exploited killed harassed persecuted raped by the white men and women so we have for example langston hughes's uh, poem harlem where uh, hughes's questions what will happen if you continuously keep on denying the black populace its rights and uh, everything there might come a time where there will be a very big explosion there will be a very big revolution where the blacks might come out and revolt and overthrow this unjust or racist society so this binary as derrida says uh, should be reversed should be dismantled the blacks should be given their rights they should be brought to the front they should be brought to the first position and it is what hughes's poem is also referring to or for example we have the binary of the master and the slave the colonizer and the colonized which we find in for example shakespeare's the tempest where we have on the one side the character of prospero and on the other side the character of caliban now caliban was the only inhabitant on the island before the arrival of prospero and the uh, few times later or some time later after prospero's arrival prospero becomes master of the island and caliban is complaining to prospero that i showed you everything i made it possible for you to live on this island i showed you where are the fields where is the fertile land where is the barren land i showed you where are the fresh springs or where is where you can find fresh water and i showed you where to avoid where are where is salty water i informed you uh, made you aware about each and everything on the island 
and now you have become my master or you have started ruling over me you have colonized me how just is this so the binary of the master and the slave or the colonizer and the colonized again derrida says binary should be reversed or dismantled the colonized or the slave should be given his or her due should be given his or her rights or we have the marxist binary that is of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat where obviously the bourgeoisie have everything and the proletariat or the working class have nothing before them or nothing with them and we have the example of the gujarati poet sundaram's ran padoshi or three neighbors here where the sheikh is having uh, tons of money with him and on the other side we have this widowed old lady mapur who has nothing with her hello so sir yes, rohan yes, sir yes, yes so you have 10 minutes with you sure sure i'll just round up quickly yeah yeah so, uh, okay thank you thank you and so the widow the old lady has nothing with her and she has to work for the shade uh, to earn a meager sum of money so that she can fill in her empty stomach uh, she has been going hungry for maybe days on end and she has nothing to eat so one class or one set of people or one group of people which has everything before them or with them and the other group of people which has nothing with them or before them and again deconstruction or derrida says that reverse or dismantle this binary give the proletariat or the working people their due their rights finally and here we uh, emerge out of uh, derridian uh, thoughts on um, language or on binaries and we focus on the concept of intertextuality which is also uh, very much uh, occupying a center position or central position in post thoughts and this term intertextuality has been coined by julia kristeva in her essay word dialogue in novel published in the year 1966 and what is intertextuality is that no text is original no idea is unique every text either reworks or rewrites previous texts and what linda hutchin says repetition with variation there is repetition with slight major or minor changes but ultimately there is repetition there is no novelty of newness or complete originality or uniqueness or what she terms as it as adaptation so for example we have uh, the poem uh, t s eliot's macavity the mystery cat from his collection of poems old possums book of practical cats where eliot is uh, on the surface talking about a very powerful cat whose name is macavity and he is a very sharp criminal he is so smart that he commits crimes but nowhere uh, is he detected nowhere is he caught is that he commits crimes but before the police reaches or the officers reach he is able to escape he cannot be caught but for readers familiar with uh, the anterior text or the precursor text they will immediately connect macavity with the villain in the sherlock holmes short stories professor moriarty professor moriarty is also a very famous criminal who commits crimes steals kills but is never caught he is so smart that no proof exists based on which he can be convicted so immediately the name macavity reminds the reader of professor moriarty from the sherlock holmes stories obviously for intertextuality to work uh, the audience or the reader should be knowing and not unknowing knowing in the sense that i should have read conan doyle's short story the final problem wherein the character of professor moriarty appears if i have not read the short story or i am not aware about the character or the story then here i will not be able to detect any connection with the previous text so hutchen also distinguishes between knowing and unknowing readers or audiences for intertextuality to work obviously you should be or the reader should be familiar with the anterior or precursor text but ultimately the idea or the concept is that originality or complete originality is not possible in the holmes short story the master criminal was a professor of mathematics and in eliot's poem the master criminal is a cat 
so there is repetition there is a master criminal but there is variation on the earlier one you had the professor and in this one it is a cat a feline mysterious cat so it is repetition but with slight or major changes to quickly uh, summarize uh, what uh, post structuralism and deconstruction indulge in post structuralism believes that meaning is not Uh, very much clear it is very difficult to determine a single precise or clear meaning so it is a questioning of the grounds of language it is a questioning of uh, metaphysics of presence or logocentrism the possibility that there is always a single clear or precise meaning rather derrida or deconstruction says that there will always be more than one meanings and because there are more than one meanings you will experience aphoria you will not be able to decide which meaning is correct and which not because both will be correct at the same time so language is not reliable the first point second deconstruction is a critique of centers power centers that those who occupy the center or the power center in any structure they themselves are not bound by any rules or regulations or strictures you cannot go and start questioning them and if you try to there is a possibility that you might be challenged you might be harassed you might be persecuted and third derrida is very much concerned with dismantling or reversing the binary where those people or groups or entities which have been denied their rights which have been underprivileged which have been harassed or exploited uh, derrida says should be given their due and finally not directly related with deconstruction but still a very much crucial post structural idea is that of intertextuality the belief that no originality exists there is always uh, slight or minor changes and the previous text is rewritten or uh, reread finally this question should be pondered upon to what extent is post structuralism marxism in disguise or cultural marxism because marx talked about only one class or the uh, divide between two classes the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and derrida brings in a list of other uh, oppositions whether it is the opposition between the whites and the blacks racism whether it is the opposition between the colonizer and the colonized colonialism or it is obviously capitalism so where marx tried to change or bring about a change only in the capital structure derrida or deconstruction is trying to bring about a change in the cultural structure where those who have been denied their rights for one or the other reason because they are uh, queer lesbian gays bisexual transgenders they should be given their rights or whether it is the colonized they should be given their rights so it is rather than uh, pure marxism or capitalist marxism it is cultural marxism these are the works cited and this concludes my presentation thank you thank you thank you so much professor rohal i hope i am audible to you yes yes you are sir uh, indeed a very uh, lucid but well organized well structured presentation sir thank you sir thank you very much although you were presenting on post structuralism it was so very structured sir <laughs> <laughs> my god <laughs> uh, uh we are we are really sorry for the initial technical glitch that happened sir no uh, no that is all right i think the, you the managed thing, well ha huh, the thing was that i turned on uh, the slide show and it was true, not true. visible but and i on like, my, <laughs> initially for the first 10 15 minutes could not see anything my screen was literally blank so like oh. uh, i wasn't aware what was happening Uh, wow. Although I got a call from uh, uh, one or two participants, that's how I got to know that there was some major glitch in the beginning. Yeah. No, no, apologies for that. <laughs> <laughs> apologies from R and also, sir. All right, uh, dear participants, if there is any query, you can drop them in the chat box, or if you want to unmute yourselves and ask. At present, I don't find any question in the chat box. If somebody wants to unmute. uh and ask a question or drop a question please
I have observed, sir, that uh, when people uh, uh, explain Derrida or when they take up deconstruction, they just uh, give a passing mention that uh, Marx, Heidegger, Nietzsche, etc., Freud, and others were they were major inspiration on uh, uh, somebody like Derrida. Derrida. Oh, huh, yes. Yes, but then you explained it uh, through points, through examples, through reasons how it is so. So that is something I found commendable, uh, including many other things. Thank you. Mm, I believe the participants are still absorbing the comprehensiveness of the presentation. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, see, this is uh, sometimes it the same thing that you know teachers say in the class. And, uh, when there are no questions, there can be two possibilities. One, no, no. I'm sure the first one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, but we have compliments dropping in the chat box for you, sir. Uh, uh, Kushbu Laku Pota says, Thank you, sir, for the clear explanation. Uh, okay, there's a question Why Bath changed his view from structuralism po to post structuralism? Right. Now, uh, obviously, see, uh, when you say structuralism, uh, Bath uh, discusses the five or six codes. He says that each and every text repeats this code. You find a similar pattern. Every text works like this. So there is the action code, uh, the mystery code, where, for example, someone knocks on the door and the reader or the viewer immediately starts to think. So who is this person that is knocking on the door? Who is the person inside that will respond? So it creates suspense. It creates mystery. It creates intrigue. So, uh, on for, from a structuralist perspective, Bach trying, tries to dig out similarities, which can be detected or found in texts of different languages, different cultures, a, a, a kind of an archetypal approach, if you would like to call it. So, when he prefers structuralism, he tries to dig out similarities of structure within texts. But then he says or uh, modifies his opinion that no, not every text uh, can be understood in this way. Rather, several texts or many texts are writerly texts rather than readerly. Is that instead of quietly imbibing what the author wants to say or intends to say, it is the reader who actually actively participates in the meaning making process. It is the reader who actually takes on the responsibility of uh, giving meaning or a signified to the text. The same example that we discussed in the presentation from Frost's poem, that is the poem of the speaker talking about success or is the speaker talking about failure? Because both interpretations or points can be considered valid. So this is what uh, Bart would call a writerly text, uh, where the reader writes or decides or interprets the meaning. So not every text can be understood with on the basis of what it shares or what is similar in it with other texts that have come before it. Several texts will demand an active uh, participation from the reader to, to provide a meaning to it or attach a meaning with it. All right. Um... Another question, I think this uh, would be the last question for the day. This is from Yogi Trivedi, sir. Uh, she's asking, can you throw some more light on the concept of logocentrism? Yes, sure. Logos, which translates to the word of God. And when we say the word of God, where do we find the word of God? We find it in the Bible. We find it in the Old and the New Testament. And the word of God means the message or the command or the directions given by God. And these commands or message or directions are very simple. They are unambiguous. The moment you listen to them or read them, they are clear to you. So the Ten Commandments, for example, they might say, you should not steal. So it is very clear that I should not take away something that belongs to others, whether it is an object or even when I am writing my examination paper, I should not try to peep in the paper of another one. So that is also stealing. I should not steal. You should not steal. Or you should not lie. 
you should not utter a lie you should not utter a falsehood so the word of god or logos is very clear very precise very unambiguous but if we expect the same thing from the language that we use in our everyday life then it is a mistake is what derrida trying to say because the language that is used in everyday conversation is not so unambiguous is not so clear or precise so if i say we had a blast at the party so what am i trying to say did we have an actual blast at the party maybe the speaker which was so loud it uh, burst maybe the speaker stopped working blast in that sense uh, or blast in the sense of fun we had a lot of fun we had a blast at the party so uh, immediately in most cases language gives out to you meaning in excess it tries to say something but at the same time it also says something extra the three examples that we discussed uh, in the presentation john wrote a poem on the mountains so did he write a poem on the mountains that is in kavita no vishay parvato hota the subject of the poem were mountains or did he go went to the mountain top sat there and wrote a poem about something else so immediately language bursts into plurality of signified more than one meaning more than one signified so logos or logocentrism in religion is fine where the word of god is very clear or precise but when you come to everyday language or everyday discourse language is not so clear or not so precise uh all right i hope the question has been answered uh, uh sir uh, this was indeed a very uh, uh comprehensive view on post structuralism and deconstruction uh, i know that you have many more things to say uh, okay. uh if, maybe uh, maybe our participants if they have some doubts they can definitely uh, contact you through your mail yeah, uh, i would like to add without any exaggeration that professor rohal is widely read when it comes to uh, all these liberating discourses in, uh, including deconstruction and its uh, offshoots so uh, dear participants if you have any queries you can contact him and is generous enough to reply to our queries always i have had this personal experience uh, because he was a classmate and a very dear friend he is thank so, you thank you thank you sir yeah. yeah thank you sir i i on behalf of alumni association uh, department of english take this opportunity to uh, formally place on record my thanks to you thank you for sparing your valuable time despite your very very hectic schedule of examination no obviously uh, i have a very emotional connect with the department my alma mater so true. any time when it is possible definitely and i would like to thank the department as well as all the participants listeners for having me so thank you for giving me yeah, this opportunity yeah equally equally a pleasure sir thank you so much thank you dear